Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Collaboration, Organization, Cooperation, and Technology. This webinar is brought to you in, with, in cooperation with WINGS, Worldwide in, Initiatives for Grant Maker Support. And we will be hearing a little bit about WINGS from Daniela Santos in just a couple of minutes. And just a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Kyla Hunt. I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup, and I will be your facilitator today. A little bit about the staff here, our presenters here at this webinar. Um, today we will be having Briggs Bamba from Trust Africa speak a little bit about his collaboration efforts with the Zimbabwe Alliance, and we will then be listening. We, we will then be hearing from Michael DeLong from TechSoup. He's our community manager here, and he will be talking a little bit about technology tools that will be able to aid you um, in online collaboration. And then also assisting with chat today will be Becky Wiggins. So if you see her name pop up in that chat box. That is who will be answering a lot of your technical questions that you may have about connecting to GoToWebinar. Again, any of your questions that you may have, um, go ahead, type those into the questions pane. We will be keeping an eye out on them, and we will be reading them audibly to the presenters later in the session. And so again, we will be first hearing a little bit about who WINGS is. We'll then be hearing from Briggs Bamba from, about the Zimbabwe Alliance, followed by Michael DeLong about online collaboration tools, and then a little bit about from Q&A from the participants. So, Daniela, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about WINGS. Daniela, are you on? Hello, everybody. Yes. Hello everybody, I'm Daniela Santos, I'm the program manager for WINGS. WINGS is the worldwide initiative for brand maker support. We are a network of networks and we are global, we, our mandate is global and we are the only truly worldwide network that represent and serve the broad community of grant makers, foundation and philanthropy support organization. Our mission is to strengthen philanthropy and the culture of giving to mutual learning support, knowledge sharing, and professional development. So if you like to know, if you don't know about us, would like to know more, please visit our website, wingsweb.org. We'll have a lot of news coming up next month. Okay, thank you, Daniela. I really appreciate that. And then before we get really get started with the content of the webinar, what we wanted to do What we wanted to do was go ahead and start and provide the poll, a little bit of a polling questions, just to get a feel for who you are. So the first question is, are you involved in any collaborative efforts? And it's a very simple yes, no question. And so far, looking at who has responded, it's about 100% yes. So that's actually really good. I think that then hearing a little bit about further collaborative efforts will be really helpful. And then hearing a little bit of polling will be, or a little bit about technology tools will be even more so. so I'm going to close this in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. I'm just sharing that. And it does look like about 89% of you out there are involved in collaborative efforts and 11% are not. And just going ahead and hiding those results. Let's go ahead and go to our second poll. What is your primary interest in joining this webinar? The first option to get more insights for my current collaboration to prepare for new collaborative efforts, to reflect on past collaborations, and just general interest in the topic. I'll give you guys just a couple of moments to fill those out. And I'm going to close it in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
And let's take a look at those results. It looks like 20% of you are wanting to get more insights for your current collaboration. 40% are wanting to prepare for a new collaborative effort. And 40% just want to get more information about the topic. You just have a general interest. So thank you guys. That's really going to be helpful in just having, allowing our presenters to correctly speak to your needs. And so with that, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and give the control over to Briggs. And I'm going to unmute him so he can speak with us. Just give me one moment while I do that. All right, Briggs, you can go ahead and... show your screen. Briggs, are you there? Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Yes, can you hear me? I can. You sound really good. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to be talking uh, today about uh, Zimbabwe Alliance. Uh, this is a collaborative, it's a donor collaborative uh, initiative um, which has been uh, in existence for a little over two years now. Um, so the way that um, we work is that uh, this is an initiative that is hosted uh, by Trust Africa. And uh, Trust Africa is a Pan-African uh, grant-making organization which is headquartered uh, in Dakar, Senegal. So I'm going to sort of go um, back uh, into, sorry, yeah, so I'm going to just give you a bit of an overview um, of Zima Lines. And uh, this is, you know, a collaboration of like-minded partners. Uh, we work within a human rights framework uh, to promote vibrant civil society and democratic transformation uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, the alliance itself brings donors and civil society together in a spirit of collaboration, uh, with the idea being to leverage limited resources uh, and increase collective efficiency and also maximize uh, impact uh, on the ground. Um, our background, as I said, 2009, um, when uh, those time when Zimbabwe was coming through, coming out of what was um, one of the worst ever economic crises. Um, for any country, inflation was over uh, 500 million percent, um, total collapse of the economy, uh, more than 90 percent unemployment, political tensions were very high, uh, but you still had people who were here trying to figure out uh, how to make a living and how to build a, a better future. So in an inclusive government which brought together uh, the key protagonists in the political conflict um, was created, we saw an opportunity, we saw an opening um, uh, resulting from the lowering of political tensions and the potential that was there for some kind of economic stabilization uh, for us to come in and support civil society in playing a crucial role uh, to ensure that the um, opening gap that uh, we started to see will be widened uh, into democratic momentum and would see uh, a successful democratic transformation uh, in the country. And um, the, the reason why collaboration m made sense at that particular time is, uh, was really around how a number of groups could respond in a timely manner uh, without having to invest each individually in the infrastructure that you need to start to making grants uh, 
in Zim and pursue other strategies uh, that we were looking at. So a collaborative effort offered the best framework for a timely intervention, uh, particularly for funders who were new uh, to the Zimbabwe question. So uh, there's always, you know, a question of how different uh, people meet. You know how people. Um, uh, there was a time when a lady uh, by the name Nomboniso Gasa uh, from South Africa came to Washington D.C. on a hunger strike. Uh, she was on a hunger strike, 21 day hunger strike, uh, to raise awareness about the humanitarian crisis in Zimbabwe and the plight of Zimbabwean refugees in South Africa. Uh, and I, I worked to together. Uh, by that time I was working in Washington DC as um, director of campaigns for an Africa solidarity group called Africa Action and I worked together with Miss Cynthia Ryan who is the principal of the Skuna Foundation uh, to host meetings for Nombo Niso. We took her to Congress uh, to have briefings there with people who were you know, working on Zimbabwe, meeting with different um, uh, actors and stakeholders in Washington DC and uh, her example of solidarity was quite inspiring to us. Uh, we had all been involved in different ways with the Zimbabwe question but here was a lady who was putting a life on the block basically to you know bring attention to what was happening in Zim. So, so after um, no, Boniso's visit, uh, Cynthia and I uh, kept thinking about how we could do more, but also how we could do more together. Uh, this event had been together. So that uh, searching and thinking ended up resulting in us uh, organizing a dozen or so funders uh, in Washington, D.C. to uh, come to a convening uh, which was specifically looking at the challenges and opportunities of funding in Zimbabwe. Uh, that convening was hosted by uh, the Wallace Global Fund, um, and then at that convening we also made sure that um, there was representation uh, from Trust Africa, uh, uh, from the, so the executive director actually came from Dakar to attend that meeting. And then from that process, uh, it became clear that uh, if we created a collaborative framework, we're going to be able to respond quickly, we're going to be able to um, derive quite a number of advantages from that process, and then that's how the collaborative itself uh, began. Um, and currently, we have Trust Africa based in Dakar, Senegal. We have the Skuna Foundation based in Boston uh, in the U.S. We have Internet. National Development Exchange based in San Francisco and with the Wallace Global Fund uh, who are based in Washington DC. We're at a point where uh, we are, because of the opportunities that currently exist in Zim, uh, the country is just lead, uh, heading towards a watershed election and everyone sees this as you know, the most defining moment for a generation. So I'm just about to have another convening so that we can expand uh, our numbers have a convening and then also discuss the opportunities that are there uh, at the ground. So um, the way uh, uh, the, collaborative, the collaborative itself work is that uh, these different funders pool resources um, together. Uh, Trust Africa hosts uh, these resources uh, as a fiscal agent, but also Trust Africa serves as the management for the alliance. Uh, so things, you know, the technical things around grant administration, uh, around managing the, you know, program work uh, that's undertaking, you know, the or pushing forward the work of the alliance on the ground. That's all done uh, at Trust Africa, and then uh, everyone participates. Uh, in everyone who's a member who's putting resources into the collaborative uh, pool participates in the steering committee um, and that's where you know key strategy decisions are made uh, you know police ensuring that um, you know we are we are all moving together that's done at, at the steering committee level 
when um, uh, we are all there. But it's a process. It has taken a bit of an evolution for us to actually come up with a clear um, uh, sense of you know the governance structures that work. We even used to have a management committee at one point, you know, early in the game. But then we realized that we, you know, just a steering committee and a single institution uh, playing the role uh, of management was working. So we coordinate since we are all scattered all over, you know, some are in Cape Town, some are in Pretoria, uh, Dakar, I'm in Harare right now, we have people in Washington, D.C., uh, San Francisco. So a lot of our coordination actually happens, you know, electronically. And then we create a few opportunities uh, where we are able to meet uh, physically. Uh, and the approach that we take to making a difference in Zimbabwe involves convenings. Uh, so we seek to set uh, the agenda for change by convening people to, on critical issues of the day, um, or in a way we feel that there are gaps in understanding it could be the context, you know, just understanding the context so that people can come up with context sensitive responses. Uh, we've been taking the initiative to facilitate that space, uh, creating those convenings, and then uh, usually from there uh, we also identify um, initiatives, uh, local initiatives to support through grant making. Uh, and then our focus is also around capacity building um, uh, for, you know, the differences society organizations that we're working on and also advocates. In fact, you can summarize our approach uh, by, you know, two words, change and sustainability. You know, so on the change side, really we are pushing democratic change, social economic change, and then sustainability, which involves our capacity building. We are looking at the sustainability of CSOs. Um, and uh, our, our one of our early motivations when we're coming into Zim or into Zimbabwe was also a realization that it wasn't just a question of uh, a shortage of resources, but it was also a question of uh, those who were not being served by available resources. So we've made uh, a particular uh, focus on reaching out to traditionally marginalized groups such as your cultural activists. Uh, you know, we've worked with filmmakers, poets, uh, artists of all sorts, uh, you know, women's groups, uh, especially in a patriarchal setup like ours, uh, and community based in grassroots groups and their youth groups as well. Um, so, in terms of some of the projects that we've worked on, um, the the flagship project that uh, we are actually working on right now in Zim is actually the setting up of an NGO center uh, that's a basically creating an infrastructure in terms of physical space, um, you know, the, uh, resource uh, centers, so your, your reference libraries, your computer workstations, um, your meeting space that people can use, industrial printers, uh, basically creating an infrastructure where uh, traditionally uh, incapacitated groups are actually able to access uh, this infrastructure and these resources and this IT uh, equipment in a way that helps them, um, you know, have greater impact on their work. Uh, we've been, uh, we are in alliance, so it's collaboration, uh, initiatives that are alliance oriented, uh, actually centerpiece uh, of our work. So we look out uh, for initiatives that go beyond the individual. So we've been supporting, uh, you know, coalitions, and common platforms where civil society organizations are actually able to uh, coordinate strategies um, and uh, also you know, share perspectives in terms of key processes that are happening, constitutional reform, uh, elections, uh, we know we've been doing work with cultural activists, doing work uh, with community activists. Uh, also, uh, we one of the major projects we did was around uh, um, democratization of local government. Um, and then a, another very important uh, area of our work has been in the area of promoting the Zimbabwean the diaspora re-engagement uh, for participation in the country's reconstruction and democratization. Um, some of you might be aware that uh, the crisis that I talked about at the beginning, you know, the, those hyperinflation, the collapse, resulted in, you know, it's estimated that more than three million 
uh, Zimbabweans left, or some say a third of the country left. So you have a lot of Zimbabweans now in South Africa, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, some in the US, uh, and all over. So part of our efforts is to um, support initiatives that organize uh, the diaspora for contribution to processes that are happening back home on, on a development level, but also on the political uh, level. And then the collaborative framework itself, you know, at one point, uh, like peeling an onion, there are so many layers uh, to it. And for us, the outer, outer layer, which is what brought us uh, together, was really this common geographical focus uh, on wanting to make a difference in Zimbabwe. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we had to come to an agreement, uh, you know, on a shared perspective of what is actually wrong uh, in Zimbabwe. So the characterization of the crisis itself, and we've had to invest quite a bit of time to have the same characterization of the crisis. Because for some, it's just it's, it's it's easy to even personalize the crisis, and then for others, we are looking at more structural issues. So uh, investment of time in developing a shared perspective uh, on the context and um, the dynamics that are shaping the crisis in Zimbabwe has been very, you know, a critical process. Without that, it's just, you know, impossible for us to be able to move to other, you know, layers. So there's been also, once we come to an understanding, uh, shared understanding of the perspectives, then we also need to have a shared um, strategy, basically, um, you know, at least, uh, a discussion around what's the best way to respond uh, to this. So all of those is, you know, meant quite a lot of back and forth uh, and facilitated processes that allow all of us to, you know, to come to the same page. And so it's been an ongoing uh, shared learning process, uh, basically. But the collaborative itself has created a safe place for us to, you know, uh, put all our thinking on the table and then. Uh, um, you know, move, move from there. And then in terms of what, what this has meant to the partners who are on the table, um, I I read a few lines here from Baking Coast and uh, for him you're saying, you know, the collaborative itself uh, prevented a duplication of efforts, uh, you know, among these groups that are on the table, but um, it also um, um, gelled in with South Africa's approach, you know, it reaffirmed the approach around collaboration, dialogue, consultation, uh, and then uh, South Africa was already working on a similar uh, process in Liberia, uh, and, you know, the experiences on either side have been feeding into each other. So South Africa collaborates with Humanity United on a major uh, civil society project uh, in Liberia. So there's been, you know, another platform for learning, uh, sharing experiences, and, you know, uh, that has worked. And then Trust Africa is a Pan-African um, uh, institution, as I said. Uh, we currently have projects, I think, in 35 countries uh, on the continent. So already, you know, there's a uh, well-developed network across the continent, uh, which is important when it comes to of solidarity, movement building, the advocates that I referred to. So like, the collaborative framework allowed South Africa to avail itself uh, or to give offer itself as a service to other uh, uh, grand makers who want to come into this space but who do not have uh, that kind of a background. And then for Cynthia Ryan, um, the principal of uh, the Schooner Foundation, uh, she says, you know, the benefits have been both political and philosophical. Uh, Schooner Foundation is a small family foundation. So she says, as a small family, US-based foundation, they never had the staff. No, they never had the staff to do the due diligence required to understand the complexities of the ever-changing situation on the ground, not the means to find the best local organizations doing the work as well as not having the mechanism to fund the groups uh, that are not registered as 541C3. Uh, so Trust Africa is a fiscal uh, sponsor or anchor for the alliance. Trust Africa is a 501c3 organization, so it has also allowed 
um, you know, groups like uh, Skuna Foundation to put in small resources, but because of the partnerships with the other alliance members, uh, these are leveraged uh, for greater impact. Uh, you know, even if you put in a hundred thousand, uh, others are putting in more money, and then you're actually able to, you know, become part uh, of a process uh, that, you know, uh, producing much greater impact. So um, um, there have been challenges, uh, obviously, and I think part of it is, you know, it's even a cultural. Um, uh, clash in a way where for small groups they tend to be small donor organizations, they prefer smaller grants, whereas some of the bigger groups um, uh, actually believe that you know the best way to proceed is larger grants um, and some uh, so even issues around where do we focus um, your your more a professional civil society organizations that have you know technical capacity or the hard work of pulling up and supporting those on the margins so there's there's been a bit of those um, clashes um, but I think an open process um, and a commitment to more of like a consensus driven process at the steering committee level has been able to um, help you know with with that. Um, so we also had, you know, a tough experience early in the process when uh, one of the anchor organizations for the collaborative itself had an internal crisis that was debilitating, uh, but they had key responsibilities in the alliance. So we ended up losing quite a bit of momentum and they had to recover some credibility as well with a number of stakeholders. So what one group ends up doing is if they are prominent actors, in the collaborative will end up uh, affecting um, you know the others as well so that's that's been one of one of the challenges um, so I have a he is saying okay now I figured out how to move this thing uh, so like all collaborations we had to learn about our individual and organizational cultures approaches and principles what to compromise and what not to compromise, what to prioritize and what to leave for later. In many ways, it has been an opportunity to deepen our understanding of ourselves, particularly of our identity and principles. Um, Cynthia says, we learned that it was necessary to have a paid staff uh, managing logistics and communications and being the link between the different partners. We learned a difficult lesson when a crisis at one found founding partner organizations affected several others. And I want to say at the very beginning, we actually thought that we were going to do this without some kind of a secretariat to the project. We just thought that uh, the founding partners would be able to come together and then uh, share the different responsibilities and tasks among themselves. But then we realized that you know all these different groups already have their own mandates. So once you have that, uh, uh, to try and save time for the collaborative workers well, was just not practical. So we ended up investing uh, in actually developing a staff complement uh, to run the collaborative, but also Trust Africa ended up fully integrating uh, this. And then I think for all of us uh, on the collaborative, it's, you know, the over on, despite the challenges, um, you know, one would say it has been worth it uh, for Trust Africa. They used to have a number of grants uh, in Zim, but all are now connected. They're much more harmonized under the plan of the alliance, and they are also, you know, leveraging their resources together with others. Uh, and for you know, groups like Schooner, they feel that it has added value uh, to the grants that they are making. Um, and you know, the benefits of having different actors with their own perspectives, sharing ideas, tactics, strategies. Uh, balances out some difficult process of letting go of total control over how the money will be spent in that process. Trust and respect for others with different views, points is fostered and developed. So uh, it has been worth it. Uh, how are we doing on time? Because the the, the remaining uh, slides. You know, this is really on 
sorry, that was really just um, examples of the projects, some of the projects that we have partnered. Um, and then, you know, like right at the end, these are sort of accomplishments. You know, we feel like we've been able to secure civil society's voice in key processes, advancing democratic transformation. Uh, I think we've been able to create uh, platforms for civil society groups to dialogue, coordinate strategies, and collaborate. Uh, we've been able to have rapid response work in the case of attacks on human rights defenders, extending welfare support, even involving pay paying bail for, you know, people who are uh, basically political prisoners uh, and uh, contributing uh, to end political detentions. Um, we've been able to build, you know, uh, solidarity in the region and internationally contributed to that. Uh, and very importantly, we've been able to help bring back the Zim diaspora for which are pe these are actually people who were the most educated, they're the ones who had opportunities to leave, so they are, you know, skilled, experienced, so we've been facilitating a process for them to come back. We're actually working right now on a project, a school's project, where, you know, former uh, students of these schools that are now dilapidated, but these students are now in, in Europe, in the U.S., uh, through the work that we are doing with the Development Foundation of Zimbabwe, they are playing a role in contributing to the rebuilding and rehabilitation uh, of their schools. So, and also issues around capacity building for rural and urban council representatives uh, so that they deliver and engage in democratization of local government. So, I will leave it at that. And uh, do I need to do anything to hand over power to you? I will. I will take the. I will take the control over in just one second. One question that I was going to ask Briggs um, that came in, which which is, can you give us some tips on how to overcome some of the cultural challenges when it comes to collaborating? One of the things is actually being able to, you know, a preparedness to um, engage openly and compromise. Know what you can compromise on um, because if we were all, you know, going to be hard line on where we were coming from, it was just not going to work. So knowing that, um, you know, a compromise on certain things is actually not uh, a sign of weakness but it's facilitatory to the process. Uh, it's a give and take. So, um, so that's uh, that. And then the second thing has also been um, consultation processes with people on the ground. Because sometimes we found out that it's easier for the collaborating partners to come to an agreement uh, on an approach uh, if, it is, um, if it is substantiated by you know testimony from the ground, so that consultation process with people on the ground in terms of what is the best way to move on this has actually helped us uh, where some are feeling like no 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 we should focus on these areas but then people on the ground uh, their voice has been you know very important so that consultation is key. Okay, great. Thank you, Briggs. I really appreciate that. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and give Michael control so he can go ahead and get into his section, which will be focusing on a lot of technology um, tools that you can use to help with your collaboration efforts. Um, and in that, in that sense, I, ha I do have a question from... Helena, I'm asking in terms of key learnings, have you used specific tools to plan, monitor, and or evaluate collaboration? And so Briggs be thinking about that, and we will come back to that question after we hear Michael's section. So thank you very much. That was a lovely, lovely section. And Michael, take it away. Hi, this is Michael DeLong, Online Community Manager for TechSoup, part of TechSoup Global. Uh, thanks, Kyla, for having me here today. I'm honored to be on this panel, and thank you, Briggs, for that fascinating presentation. TechSoup Global, founded in 1987 as CompuMentor, helps nonprofits globally get and use technology to heighten their impact. Through its websites, events, and community building initiatives, TechSoup Global also helps companies and foundations optimize their philanthropic impact. 
TechSoup has distributed 8.7 million technology products worldwide in partnership with 47 donors, which include Adobe, Cisco, Microsoft, Symantec, and many others. 167,000 organizations have received product donations from TechSoup, with 37,000 of those outside of, the North, of North America. And you see here on the slide, it says that 38 countries around the world uh, have been served by TechSoup, but we're excited to announce that we can now say this is 39, as we've recently added the Philippines as part of the launch of TechSoup Asia in partnership with Microsoft. To learn more about TechSoup Global and its partners and initiatives, visit www.techsoupglobal.org. So I'm here today to talk about online collaboration tools. And online collaboration is quite important to my own team, which is the online community and social media team. As a distributed team, we have team members stationed around the US from Seattle to Los Angeles and have members who frequently travel around the globe. TechSoup Global itself has offices in Warsaw and London, and many of us work cross-departmentally within the organization and with partners all over. When collaborating online, one important tool to consider is a project management tool. My own team recently has adopted Huddle as a project management tool, which is a new product available through TechSoup in North America. As donation programs differ from partner to partner, availability in your own area may vary. Huddle is a collaborative online service providing online file sharing and management, collaborative communication, project management tools, and more. Nonprofit organizations and foundations can benefit from Huddle by sharing and editing documents inside and outside the organization managing projects and tasks, and communicating via whiteboards and discussion threads. A project management tool is a great way to stay organized and accountable, and to keep all of your information in one place. One of the features I personally love about Huddle, <coughs> and some of the other project management tools I've used, is that it integrates well with whatever email setup you're currently using whether that's Outlook or Gmail or something else. It's handy to push messages out from the tool into people's inboxes, and it's even more convenient that they can respond from their own inboxes back into the tool without having to log in. Moreover, all of the communications related to a particular project wind up in a single place, which really makes searching for information mercifully easy. A San Francisco Bay Area nonprofit I recently spoke with, the Emerging Arts Professionals Network, has found project management tools like Huddle to be invaluable. I recently spoke with the managing editor of their blog, who uses the write board and calendar functions to set up a fairly airtight process for suggesting, assigning, submitting, and publishing work, with auto reminders sent to each of the writers. As all of the fellows are busy with their own full-time jobs, having a tool to keep everything organized and easy to see is crucial for the nonprofit. An editorial schedule is just one way to use project management tools collaboratively and could also be used by nonprofits and foundations for a variety of uses, including fundraising events, planning, grants tracking, program management, and more. A last great feature I want to call out with the calendar in the project management tool is that under a particular umbrella project, you can create multiple related projects and view those in a dashboard. Whatever deadlines and tasks you have assigned in those individual projects will aggregate to the master calendar in the dashboard view. This is another invaluable tool for keeping distributed teams on the same page. So I'm going to demonstrate a little bit what that looks like. Uh, Huddle's a fairly new uh, tool for my team, so we haven't gotten it completely set up. But I'll give you a, an example of what this might look like. So we used Huddle recently to help plan our annual digital storytelling challenge. 
And as you can see here, there are a number of different uh, deadlines and tasks assigned in the calendar. And this one here is with a weekly meeting, which is assigned to everyone in the working group. So if I go to one of the other workspaces that's under uh, the related project of the community and online social media team, um, I can go and create a task. and assign that a due date. And then you'll see that when I go back to my dashboard view, what I get is the uh, deadlines from various projects rolled up into a master view in the calendar. So that's very useful for keeping everybody on the same page and creating a calendar that uh, can aggregate a number of different deadlines across projects. Okay. So there are uh, dozens of project management tools out there, all with different sets of features. So choosing the right project management tool for your own team can be a bit daunting and it's a decision that should be made carefully and with uh, thorough research and testing. A recent article on TechSoup by Laura S. Quinn of Idealware outlines six important features to consider in a project management tool. The six areas include planning projects, managing tasks, sharing and collaborating on documents, sharing calendars and contacts, managing issues and bugs, and tracking time. If you want to read the full article, I've created a short link here, which is http colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash ts dash pm. In the same article, Laura goes on to say, almost everyone we spoke with desired a single project management super tool that included all of the functionality they cared about. However, no one was using something they were actually happy with in this capacity. In fact, there was little agreement on which functions should be included in such a tool. So it's unlikely that one package will meet all sophisticated project management needs or all of the areas listed above. This quote highlights just how careful your decision-making process needs to be when you're choosing a project management tool that's right for you. When the online community and social media team was choosing our own project management tool, we'd gone through a number of tools that just didn't seem to stick for us. So we created a page in our wiki, which is another online collaboration tool, which I'll get to in just a minute. And we listed out all of our must-have features and some of the top contenders for us based on research. And from this, we developed a Google Docs spreadsheet, which is yet another important type of online collaborative tool. So we could see how the tools compared in different categories. Now, I would really recommend this uh, type of online collaboration decision-making process. These types of tools, like wikis and uh, Docs, document sharing tools allow stakeholders to view and edit documents all at one time and it will tell you when someone else is looking at the document and it even allows for chat within the documents for any important decision making that might pop up on the fly. Besides Google Docs, another popular online document sharing and editing tool is Windows Live SkyDrive. Now this past winter at TechSoup, we were working across several departments to launch the Microsoft Local Impact Map, which you see a screenshot of here on the slide. And I've included a link as well if you'd like to uh, visit the Impact Map. It's a, a recent project that's uh, pretty cool that TechSoup Global's worked on. Um, at any rate, uh, we were working across many departments and had to organize a complex system of sourcing, editing, and publishing stories and we were using a really wide variety of resources, uh, both inside and outside of the organization. So the shared spreadsheet and file sharing capabilities of Windows Live SkyDrive really helped make the process smooth and easy to manage and track. 
There's some other file sharing um, and online document resources, which include Dropbox, which allows for the transfer of large files, including video and audio. And they have both free and paid accounts. And there's also Evernote, which is a great tool for creating living documents um, that can be shared. So in my role as online community manager at TechSoup, I work with a large core group of dedicated volunteers, and they live all across the country. So these volunteers oversee the TechSoup discussion forums, where folks from the social benefit sector come to discuss technology and get their questions answered by peers and experts. The TechSoup discussion forums are an engaged online environment that is flexible and consistently adapting, both in terms of the technology platform as well as the policies around community behavior. In setting the policy and in keeping the forum volunteers up to speed on all the latest technological enhancements, I have found Evernote to be an invaluable tool. Evernote allows me to create living documents that are easy to share and can be accessed from just about anywhere. I have the client downloaded on my iPad and my phone and both my work and home laptops. And it can also be simply accessed online via a web browser. So as changes in policy and process uh, take shape during the uh, online discussions that I have with the uh, core group of forum volunteers, I can go in and make updates to existing training documents in Evernote that reflect these and they're easy to share uh, with all of the volunteers. And the documents also allow for multiple privacy settings in case there's any sensitive information in there. You can share with everyone or with everyone who has the link, or you can set up special permissions for just those people uh, whom you want to see the documents. So earlier I mentioned wikis as an online collaboration tool. A wiki is a website that can be edited by multiple users online using a simple interface that's very easy to learn. <clears throat> Wikispaces is one of TechSoup's donor partners, and we use wikis quite a bit at TechSoup. There are a number of ways wikis can be used to collaborate online. One example is to create a wiki that overarches an entire team, working group, or even an organization. So while the online community and social media team uh, has recently adopted Huddle as our project management tool for larger campaigns and projects, we also maintain this team wiki that you see here as a team hub and collaborative brain, which keeps all of our information organized yet accessible. Wikis might also serve a more singular purpose within an organization, yet remain a collaborative space for those with permissions. A great example at TechSoup, and a personal favorite of mine, is the TechSoup Global Editorial Style Guide. This is a really great example of how a wiki might be used to set policy and structure around a specific topic in a nonprofit or foundation, yet act as a living document that is much easier to update and modify than a binder or a handbook. Another way a wiki might be used is for a specific project. So this is the wiki we used for our recent annual digital storytelling challenge. We had started off using the Huddle project management tool, but we moved to a wiki as we were working with more than 30 partners all over the world. The wiki created an easy access way for all of those stakeholders to pull relevant information without having to create their own logins. This model is a really good example for when you might have many stakeholders who will need to get information quickly, but may not necessarily be adding new information to the project or making their own edits. When TechSoup partnered with Connecting Up Australia and TechSoup Canada last year for a tweet chat that we produced, a wiki was a really perfect way for us to collaborate across different time zones and to keep our information organized and easy to pull off the wiki into tweets in real time. Whatever type of online collaboration tools you choose, there are some key lessons and considerations to keep in mind. One is to save some time for real time. 
Many of the tools uh, we've looked at today are asynchronous, but whether it's in the flesh or still online, you really can't beat making a human connection. When you can't meet in person, there are a multitude of audio and video conferencing tools to try for virtual meetings. Tools on TechSoup include GoToMeeting, which is by Citrix Online, one of TechSoup's partners, ReadyTalk, and Better World Telecom. Other products include WebEx, Adobe Connect, and the recently popular Google Plus Hangouts. With Google Plus Hangouts, you can meet with multiple members of your team face-to-face -face in real time with little more than an internet connection and a web camera. And of course, you do need to set up a profile on Google Plus as well. A last consideration is the importance of adoption and adherence by all stakeholders or team members. While there are many tools out there to use for online collaboration, it's good to pare it down and keep it simple when possible. The danger of using too many tools is that you wind up searching for information all over the place, which becomes very time consuming. So if you can set a strong policy and keep everyone on board with the process and tool from the outset, it really saves a lot of headaches later. One of our teams here at TechSoup the community-driven innovation team, uses the idea of non-negotiables. One of these includes the project management tool they use, and when new members come on board, there's a clear expectation set that they must use that tool. And uh, I just wanted to tie this back to something that Briggs said earlier that uh, struck a chord with me. Of course, he was talking on a much more macro level, but on the micro level, it's, it's, this pro, it's the same problem of the, the duplication of efforts. So setting that clear policy around which tools are used and how can really help uh, contain that information and keep uh, duplicative work from being done. And so with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, back to Kyla. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and take control back so I can get my little question slide up. All right. And so if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and type those into the questions pane. Um, we, do, we did have, again, that question that came in um, near the end of Briggs' presentation. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Briggs again. And we did have um, another question come in that was similar to it, which was wondering, um, if Briggs used any online collaboration tools um, in his collaborative efforts. Um, so Briggs, if you wanted to go ahead and take that question. Yes, we have. Um, one of the big projects that we did was to develop a video, a short video for, for Zimbabwe Alliance. Unfortunately, I didn't send a link ahead of time, but it's on YouTube. Uh, for anyone who you know wants to get more information, if you just um, YouTube Zimbabwe Alliance, it comes out. It's a, it's a video profiling our partners, the work that we're doing, and a little bit of a history for the country. So we did that uh, project scattered uh, all over uh, the world, basically, as we are, and we used uh, Basecamp, um, you know, in terms of um, sharing. Uh, schedules, the files that we wanted to share, and uh, we also used uh, we also used Dropbox for you know like large files uh, sharing. Uh, we've also used Google Docs, um, and we would not function without Skype conference. So all our steering committee meetings are uh, basically done via Skype, uh, which you know, as colleagues know, will cost us nothing. So uh, that that has worked. And then you know things like Meeting Wizard um, for s scheduling our meetings, you know, coordinating um, uh, uh, availability. Uh, we also have uh, like we have Cal that we we use for putting all our files related to the project online and uh, all guys in the steering committee are able to access um, you know those files uh, online 
So I don't say we are that heavy on these tech tools, but yeah, I'm seeing more and more how we know would not have been able to function as efficiently without Skype, without having used best camp for our video project, um, and then you know uh, those other things. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Briggs. And I'm not seeing any other questions coming at the moment, um, and we are almost out of time, but I did go ahead and put my email address in the chat box. So if you are, um, if you do have any questions after the fact, you can go ahead and email me um, at khunt at techsuitglobal.org. And let me just double check that there are, if there are any questions that have come in before I get wrapped up here. <clears throat> and it does look like, I believe we have answered most of these um, in, in a general way. And so again, Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, and again, if you do have any questions, we will be sending that YouTube link that Briggs talked a little bit about out to the rest of the audience. And so, Briggs, if you could go ahead and email me that YouTube link after the fact, that would be great, and I can go ahead and send that on. And again, we will be emailing this recording out to everybody after the fact. And so, again, a little bit about who TechSoup is. TechSoup is a nonprofit, a lot like a lot of you, who does try to provide technology and technology resources out to everybody who needs them to complete their mission. And again, I do want to thank Briggs and Michael and Becky for all helping me out with today's webinar. And of course, I want to thank Daniela and Wings for their great efforts in allowing us to provide this webinar series. So again, thank you, everybody. Be expecting that um, recording of this webinar within a week. And I will be talking with all of you again shortly, hopefully. So thank you very much. If you could give us, if you give two seconds of your time to fill out our survey after the fact, that would be great. So thank you. Have a great day. And to leave, you can go ahead and go to File, Exit, Leave Webinar. Teresa, if you are still on, I will be sending out a link about GoToMeeting. Um, just so you know, for the most part, from my knowledge, GoToMeeting, the question is how many people can share GoToMeeting at the same time. If you're a GoToMeeting account, it's 15 people. If you're on a GoToWebinar account, it depends on your... Um, on what, what you signed up for, but my account has up, you can have up to a thousand people. And there's also another tool called GoToTraining, and you can have up to 25 people on that. So I hope that answers your question. So again, thank you everybody, and I'll be closing out the webinar.